Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special forum in which we're going to be exploring the issue of whether we are creating another stolen generation among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in communities in Australia. We're so very, very pleased that you could join us here today. My name is Kerry Arabina. I'm the Professor and Chair for Indigenous Health at the University of Melbourne and Director of ANEMDA, the Koori Health uh, Research Unit in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medicine. I trained as a social worker and spent some time in Queensland in the Northern Territory working in child protection and guardianship, so the issue of keeping children and families is very, very dear to me, and I'll be facilitating today's event. We'll start the formal proceedings in a few minutes with a welcome to country, but first I just want to be able to attend some, to some housekeeping, if I may. This event will be recorded by both video and through a sound recording and will be played at Koori Radio in the near future. So to this end, we have to manage the questions that people might want to ask at the end of this session. Therefore, we have two fixed microphones at either end of the floor. And if you have a question to ask, what I'm going to um, encourage you to do is come down towards those microphones that's closest to you I'd then ask if you could provide your name, where you're from, and then ask the question. And um, thank you very much in advance for your patience in this matter. And we'll try to address as many questions as possible during this time. Um, I'd also like to start with an acknowledgement to SNAKE, the Secretariat for the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Care, which we all know affectionately as SNAKE, for providing us the opportunity to consider the impact of child removal and for instigating a new campaign to step up and address once for all the issue of over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the criminal justice system and in out-of-home care. Could you please join me now in acknowledging SNAKE and the national leadership and contribution of this organisation to our communities and also their tireless work in making this a better nation for us all. So thank you very much to SNAKE. And just two additional comments before we actually have the welcome to country. Um, the first is an apology from Nigel Scullion. Unfortunately, a very urgent um, event came up that he needed to be in attendance at. He does wish us all very well for this forum though and will be present and available for other forums around the country in future. The other is just a comment about gender equity. You'll notice that the entire panel is made up of caring and concerned and strong and powerful women from our communities. This doesn't negate or in any way reflect any of our personal views on the roles and responsibility of men as fathers, uncles, cousins, um, stewards of our families. And so for all of us today, um, we appreciate the um, roles that men bring to our families and value their contribution. We did try and get a few men lined up, but unfortunately public speaking has its <laughs> drawbacks for some of our mob. So I just wanted to make a comment around that as well. Now it gives me great pleasure to open the formal proceedings and respectfully invite Ms Georgina Nicholson to do a welcome to country before we begin. So if you can please welcome and acknowledge Georgina as she makes her way to the stand, please. Thank you, Kerry. Woman Jika. Hello, my name is Georgina Nicholson and I am a proud Wurundjeri woman. Wurundjeri being part of the Kulin Nation. The Kulin Nation is made up of five clans and they are Wurundjeri, Boonarong, Tanarong, Jaja Wurrung and Wadarong. Wurundjeri is all of Melbourne and the surrounding country. I would like to pay my respect to our ancestors, to our elders past and present, to all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and other elders here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to respectfully acknowledge 
all the Aboriginal leaders and other national leaders and SNAKE. Womanjiga Wurundjeri Balak Yemen Kundibik, meaning welcome to the traditional land of the Wurundjeri people. Our mother, Martha Margaret Nicholson, was delivered by her grandmother, Granny Jemima, and that was under a pine tree on Corrandirk Aboriginal Mission near Hillsville. Years later, our mother met a wonderful Irish man called Patrick, and that was on a blind date in Melbourne in the early 1930s. In 1935, Mummy and Daddy were married, and they had 16 children, lots of burros. Hey, yeah. Uh, and they settled in Hillsville, myself being the youngest and the oldest is Pat Hockwell, for people that might know Pat. She is the eldest of the 16, my big sister. Sadly, both our parents have passed away now and we carry on the culture for our people and most importantly, our future generations. We must respect our elders the land and the waters. So I'd, I'd like to just like, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me along today to do your welcome to country for this uh, very important event. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome to country and for setting the tone in which we'll be discussing the most precious asset in our communities, our children. As is our custom then, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, your elders past and present, and I just wanted to let you know that I've personally felt Bunjil very close over the past few weeks. I'd like to also acknowledge the elders, both past and present, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, of our many nations of First Peoples who join with us today, and our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters who walk beside us on this journey of healing. I had the chance to share this stage most recently during Reconciliation Week with Professor Mick Dodson and Brian Cohen, uh, Kean Cohen QC, to discuss the impact of the Redfern speech delivered by the then Prime Minister Paul Keating in Redfern Park on the 10th of December 1992. Not only was it delivered during a time when there was national hysteria about the Mabo case being won, a case that then challenged and overthrew the notion of terra nullius in Australia, it was really the first time a Prime Minister public acknowledged the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that the European settlers were responsible for the difficulties that continue to face our communities. In 1992, the year of the Indigenous peoples, he asked for the dispossessed to come out of the shadows and asked for our fellow Australians to recognise that we are contributing members to this Australian society. The Redfern speech was for me a watershed moment where we had the opportunity to rise to the challenge of this generation how to give proper meaning and value to the place and contributions of our First Peoples, to really cherish Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, to reach out with welcoming arms and open hearts and minds to the richness and diversity of our cultures, to take pride in us, who we are, and who we can be given the opportunity. He said that this could only happen through acts of recognition in which non-Indigenous peoples took full responsibility for the dispossessing, for smashing the traditional way of life, for bringing the disease and alcohol, for recognising the impact of and taking responsibility for the fact that the birth of our nation was founded on grim acts during which murders were committed, children were forcibly removed from their mothers, where First Peoples were subjected to discrimination and exclusion, and that it was ignorance and prejudice and above all, a failure to imagine that these things could be done to any of us at any time. So in this forum, are we creating another stolen generation? I wonder how you might feel then if last Tuesday, 
The police turned up unannounced with child protection workers to take your youngest child away. How do you explain this to your other children, to your family, to your relatives? Who can you go to for comfort? What would happen to your relationship with your partner? What would happen if you didn't have credit to make the phone calls for your phone to find out what the hell just happened? What would happen if you had no choice except to take your other children to the only clinic in the neighbourhood who were responsible for mandatorily reporting your child's health and for taking your baby away? Your child's cry is still ringing in your ears as you try to get answers from unresponsive authorities who eventually tell you that your child is doing well, has been driven hundreds of kilometres away and placed in a foster home with people who are from a different culture to yours. Finally, you get told by the police that the grounds for removal of your child were contained in a mandatory report from local clinic staff where that told us that your child was losing weight. Can you possibly imagine what this would feel like, especially if clinic staff had not offered you any support prior to your child being taken away? How would it feel to you to walk around with empty arms and an aching heart, to wake in the middle of the night calling your child's name? to do whatever it took to deaden the pain, to lose hope, to lose direction, and then finally fill up with anger. How would it feel to have these things done to you is the question that Paul Keating asked us all to consider. My hope is that none of us ever have to experience it and that all we do is in our power as a nation to overcome the complexities involved in allowing all children to live up to the opportunity of our existence. National Reconciliation Week, which started with Sorry Day on May the 26th, has recently ended. Sorry Day marks the tabling of the Bringing Them Home report in 1997, a comprehensive inquiry into the racist history of forced removal of Aboriginal children. Sorry Day was initially called to push for implementation of the recommendations in the Bringing Them Home report. One important recommendation was for a national apology to the stolen generations, finally granted by Kevin Rudd in 2008. But bringing them home was not just about the sins of Australia's past. The report also concluded that there was a dire warning in the operations of contemporary child protection agencies that were replicating many of the destructive dynamics of the stolen generation era. At the time of the report, 20% of children in out-of-home care were Indigenous, despite being only 2.7 of the population. Bringing them home said that many of the conditions of poverty and oppression experienced by many Aboriginal families were creating serious risks for the safety and development of children, but child protection agencies were discriminatory and ineffective. It said in the report that not a single submission from any Aboriginal organisation saw intervention from welfare departments as effective ways of dealing with child protection needs. And the primary reason for welfare intervention in Indigenous communities is neglect. Social inequality is the most direct cause of neglect. Problems which result in removals need to be addressed in terms of community development. Bringing them home then argued that the responsibility for Indigenous child protection needed to shift to Aboriginal controlled agencies and a major transfer of resources to Indigenous communities. A social justice investment package was urgently needed to alleviate the grinding poverty. These recommendations were ignored. Aboriginal culture and family peoples were described as failing their, their children and blamed for the socking conditions they found themselves in. Aboriginal family support services and women's centres across Australia were defunded through heavy cuts and the eventual dismantling of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission further compounded these impacts. In relation to all of those things, there has been a corresponding explosion in the numbers of Aboriginal children being removed by child protection agencies across Australia. The number of children being removed now is higher than at any time during the last century. Reports from the Productivity Commission show that on 30th of June 1997, there were 2,785 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. By the 30th of June, there were 13,200 
and 99 children, almost a five-fold increase. More than half of these children have not been placed with kin or relatives. Currently, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 10 times more likely to be in out-of-home care than any other child in Australia. Now, the question that we're posing here today is, is that acceptable? We, as an Australian society, we must have a high tolerance for the institutionalisation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children for this to be the case. Why aren't we, as a society, completely outraged? Why have we gotten worse since the acts for the call of recognition by Prime Minister Keating into 1992? Why haven't we seen fit to redress the causes of trauma, racism and disadvantage contributing to the over-representation in child protection systems and how can we ensure our children are growing up in our families? In all jurisdictions, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their supporters are gearing up to push similar demands. More than 1,000 delegates packed into the Convention Centre in Cairns last week for the conference of the Secretariat of the National Aboriginal and Child Islander Child Care, just calling for a stop to the creation of another stolen generation. And this forum is hopefully the first of many that will occur around the nation over the coming weeks and months to gauge support for this critical issue of keeping children in home in support of families. Here with us to discuss this important issue further are experts, leaders and key identities in the discussions happening around Australia and the world on the rights of children. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce our panellists, all of whom have very extensive CVs in which I've had the great, um, I've had to cut them just a little bit. But our first panellist is Professor Muriel Bamblett, CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal, Child, uh, Aboriginal Childcare Agency. Professor Bamblett has had a range of community, administrative and director roles on many boards concerning children, families and the Indigenous community. She's been a ministerial appointee, a community representative and a recipient of a number of awards that acknowledge her inspirational leadership in the field of child and family welfare, including the awarding of an AM in 2004. She is also recognised in the higher education sector, having been appointed as an adjunct in professor adjunct professor in the School for Social Work and Social Policy within the Faculty of Health Sciences at La Trobe University in 2009. Can you please welcome now our first panellist. Thank you. Secondly, we are joined by Arnie Lorraine Peters, um, a very special mentor of mine, and she has devoted many years of her life to supporting Aboriginal people on a journey of healing. During childhood, Auntie Lorraine was forcibly removed and separated from her home and family at the age of four and placed in an institution. Through her own healing journey and her involvement with the healing of others, Auntie Lorraine developed, supported and trained over 2,200 participants in Amaramali, which is a program dedicated to healing from the impact of being a member of the Stolen Generation. She has been well recognised through a series of awards, including a Deadly Lifetime Contribution Achievement Award for the Healing Stolen Generation Peoples. And on the day of the National Apology, Arnie Lorraine presented Kevin Rudd with the gift of a glass coolerman, traditionally a vessel for carrying children, but containing on this occasion a message thanking the Parliament for the apology and a symbol of hope that Indigenous peoples are placed in a new relationship with the governing body of Australia. Can we please welcome now Annie Lorraine. <laughs> Our third panellist today is Marta Mores Perez from Chile. Uh, a recently retired member and vice president of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and a special rapporteur for Australia. Ms Perez is an independent consultant in social policy, human rights and international relations who speaks at least five languages. A sociologist, Marta has worked for the UN for most part of her professional life in many senior capacities, including with UNICEF for 24 years. After her retirement from the UN, she was elected as an independent expert to the UN Committee on the Child's Rights. She serves on boards of national and international NGOs related to academic, social and political issues and women's and children's rights. Can we please welcome now? 
our third panellist for today. The fourth panellist bringing their perspective is Megan Mitchell, who is the National Children's Commissioner, who focuses solely on the rights and interests of children and the laws, policies and programs that impact on them. She has expertise in child protection, foster and kinship care, juvenile justice, children's services, childcare, disabilities, and early intervention and prevention services. Megan has held many previous roles that have put her at the forefront of children affairs in Australia, including the New South Wales Commissioner for Children and Young People and CEO of the Australian Council for Social Services. Can you please join me now in welcoming Megan? Our fifth panelist joining us from Oxfam is Dr. Helen Sokey, the current Chief Executive Officer, a position she has held from November 2012. Helen came to this role from services such as the Australian Federal Race Discrimination Commissioner and following seven years with the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. Helen has extensive experience in management, community development, organisational development, and regulations in the education and health sectors. Join me now in welcoming Helen, thank you. And our final panelist, Eva Jo Edwards, is a Muti Muti and Yorta Yorta peoples, comes from there, and is the case manager and programs officer from Connecting Home, a Victorian-based service supporting stolen generations and facilitating families reconnecting as part of them bringing them home and closing the gap initiatives. She is a stunning coordinator and spokesperson of the Koori Night Markets, a board member on many community um, organisation and task forces dealing with health and stolen generations. She is also a skilled and sought after cultural educator, a powerful and influential speaker, performer, presenter and teacher. Can we please join now in welcoming Eva. From this kind of lineup, I'm sure that what you'd like to do now is to hear them speak. So what we're going to do is invite each of our panellists to provide perhaps a five minute summary on what they perceive to be the critical issue for which we all need to stand up. So we'll start now with Muriel, thank you. Hi. Hi everybody. Um, can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, what an absolutely wonderful occasion to see so many people out there that are really um, keen to really start the journey with us, to start the journey on stopping the creation of another stolen generation because I don't think that we can, we know we can't do it by ourselves. We know that as Aboriginal people that we really are struggling with the issues. Um, I work for one of the largest Aboriginal child and family welfare organisations, the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency. And um, whilst we see uh, progress in this area, we've still got a long way to go. So um, today I certainly want to um, say that today you're going to be inspired, I believe. Um, it's an opportunity for you to challenge us as a panel. I think um, we've got a great interactive panel, so you're going to be able to write your questions down and um, challenge us on what you think needs to be done. Um, if you've got any suggestions or good um, ways forward, um, it would be really appreciated. I think it is time to step up as the campaign um, is, is about and it is important that we all step up for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, the stats are alarming and you've got, um, you would have seen some of the data but if you constantly like me um, dredge through all the data it becomes quite depressing because it doesn't change and I remember when the Bringing Them Home report came out in 1997. Um, Professor Mick Dodson at the time, he, he, he projected that at that time there were 379 children in care in Victoria and he said those figures would double within 10 years. Well, guess what? 10 years did come and guess what? Victoria's figures did double, almost to the exact number that he said they would double. It's unfortunate that he, we in Victoria at the moment, there are 1,038 Aboriginal children in care and the biggest percentage, at least 48% of those children, as um, our esteemed um, facilitator spoke about, was at least almost 48% of those are with non-Aboriginal carers. And if you think about the Aboriginal service system, um, Aboriginal services in Victoria are funded to work with approximately about 300 of those children. So there are about 700 that are with mainstream organisations. 
The advent of having an Aboriginal commissioner in Victoria is very exciting for us because at the moment, for those 700 children, we don't know what's happening. We don't know whether they've got connection to community, whether they know their family, whether they are growing up proud in their Aboriginality. So I think that there are many challenges that Victoria has. There have been many inquiries across this country, this great country of Australia, that, and what's sad, saddest most is, is that the entrenched disadvantage that is, is, is historically has impacted on Aboriginal people. Most of our Aboriginal children come into care not for abuse, but for neglect, and neglect out of poverty. Too many of our people are entrenched in poverty, and unfortunately, many of our family believe it's their right now to stay entrenched in poverty that it's up to public housing to determine where they live. And we have to break that cycle. And I think it's up to us to really, really think about how do we move people to a system, a Western system, that where they have rights before a Western system, because it is important that our people have access to housing, to accommodation, to really address the issues of the past. I'd be remiss today um, if I didn't speak about the Northern Territory and how bad the Northern Territory is. And I think that um, we should all be ashamed of what's happening in the Northern Territory. I, as an Aboriginal woman, was involved in the inquiry into um, the child protection system in the Northern Territory, which handed down its findings in October 2010. And I'm ashamed to say that a lot of the recommendations weren't implemented, and I'm ashamed to say that the situation hasn't improved for those children. If we are to step up, I think all Aboriginal people and all people should look at how do we help and give, extend a hand to all our Aboriginal people. We are Aboriginal Victoria, and yes, we have an issue, but we have an issue right across the nation. And I'm getting a look at, sideways at me, so I'm assuming that I must be running out of time. But I think that um, to, if, if we're to really move forward, we really need to address the policy failure. We really need to have really good um, research. Our primary focus has to be on prevention. We can't have a system where Aboriginal people are, are at the bottom of the cliff picking families up as they drop over. We need to have more preventative parenting programs. We need to be involved in decision making. Aboriginal, too many Aboriginal people don't know where their children are, don't know that their children are in the system. So I think it's important that we have Aboriginal people that are, all, uh, all, that are involved in child welfare. Um, I look forward to the interactive session. Um, I look forward to you challenging the whole panel. Um, and I know that we have a lot of the answers to all your questions. So very excited about being here today and um, look forward to the rest of the session. And can I say, Kerry, that was an absolutely wonderful lead-in and thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. We'll now come along to Arnie Lorraine, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, First, acknowledgement to the uh, traditional owners on the land on which we gather, and also a, an acknowledgement to all stolen generations that are past and present. Um, myself, I am a survivor of a stolen generation, and uh, I'm in my 70s, and I'm still seeing children being taken from their families, which is pretty um, frustrating and um, sad for me to see this happen because the numbers have really blown out of proportion and there's not too much being done about it. Um, the cycle needs to be broken. We need to find answers how to break the cycle um, because too many, not only our children are being removed but the incarceration of our, our younger generations is climbing as well. Um, because of the poverty, I suppose, that uh, Miriam's talking about and um, uh, through silly things that uh, maybe our, our younger generation end up inside. Um, our parents of these children are suffering. This is where the answer lies, within the families. We need to not only heal the families of these children, 
um, which is a huge job, and I've been on my soapbox for I don't know how many years that the answer lies within the families. We need to take care of the families, right? So a lot of healing needs to take place there. For 13 years I've been um, travelling the country uh, with my program, which is a five-day healing program for Aboriginal workers right across the board and um, non-Aboriginal workers as well. And um, I'm a little bit frustrated uh, at this point. And only at the beginning of the year or end of last year I had this realisation that how far am I getting with this? Is the brick wall starting to come down? So I took it to the next level. I approached uh, Minister Jenny Macklin and uh, asked for an appointment with her uh, if I can discuss where I could see the gap of this cycle to be broken. Um, I asked her to if she would fund me four pilots, a one-day training for all um, um, different departments across the, the um, um, that, that have uh, like set policies down for us. Um, this included Faxia, policy writers, Department of Human Services, social workers, the Attorney General's Health and Ageing, finance and there's still a big list waiting. Um, the need to get our story to the other side of the fence. This is where the big gap is. We need to train and educate people about the other side of the story. There might, there's some good people out there doing the job but what really my realisation was they don't have the full story. They don't have both sides of the story. So by giving them our side of the story, I know there's going to be big changes made. We have done two of those pilots with great success, with numbers wanting to do, um, to fill the other two workshops. So this is where this has taken me, hopefully, at this level, we can uh, make some changes through um, stopping our young ones being taken. You know, we have to stop our children being taken. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be people like me having to do a lot of healing around this. When those little people, when they turn 18, who, who, who am I? Who's, where's my country? Where do I belong? All these questions are being uh, asked. People, people have lost that identity. So the work around that is amazing. It's enormous. I know the Healing Foundation has about 90 programs running across the country. There are community uh, in initiatives that have been run across the, the country with great success. And one of them is ten, uh, addressing transgenerational trauma, which addresses all those things. Um, so we need a lot more work to be um, uh, in those areas. Have a look on their website at a lot of those programs and use them. Um, so education, um, for what I see from my side of the fence, education, I need to educate the other side of the fence, to work in partnership, to get to stop this cycle. So um, I hope from the four pilots that we, uh, that the department has um, uh, given me that we will expand them across the country because we have had social workers and all people at all these levels, they didn't know this side of our story. And now, hopefully, that things will change. Um, but it's a, it's a big hill. I'm only a small person chipping away, but we all have to chip in. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Aunty Lorraine. I'd like to now invite um, Ms Perez to do a 
discussion for us on some of the key issues that you think are going to be critical in this issue? Thank you very much. Good morning. I want to acknowledge and to thank the traditional owners of the land, the elders, past and present. And I, I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be amongst you, for inviting me to listen and, and to exchange uh, with you. This is a wonderful occasion and I, I am honored. <clears throat> I was wondering what, uh, what is it that I can bring to you that is not already well known and very well said by the panelists and many others. And, and I think when, what I can contribute is a, is a, is a vision, a, a view from outside, you know, an international view. And in particular, not only given my experience, but, but also having been a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, uh, who, which last year, in fact, did a review of uh, uh, progress and gaps in uh, Australia with regard to the application of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, today I have been able to as assess what uh, uh, has changed, uh, or not changed, in fact, in this one year after the recommendations. And uh, <clears throat> I can tell you that, of course, the committee acknowledged, and I acknowledge today, the fact that there is much that is being done in this country for children. One could not say that there isn't. No? There, is, uh, there are policies, there are efforts to put together national frameworks, uh, there are efforts to sharpen uh, 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 specific objectives with regard to the improvement of the situation of, of children, uh, all children and uh, the children who are uh, more vulnerable. There is lots of money being put into all of these programs, but all of this falls on a, what I would say a, a backdrop, a very alarming backdrop and context of what I, I have been struck myself by uh, this uh, sort of tremendously aggressive and violent environment um, that is, uh, and the discrimination, not only gender, uh, discrimination, we've been seeing it <clears throat> on television all these days, but also, of course, a very punitive uh, um, and uh, bias towards policies. An example, of course, is the juvenile justice system, which is uh, exactly the opposite of what all the international standards uh, dictate, international standards that have been subscribed by, by Australia. And, and I was saying, a climate of, vi of aggression and violence, um, not only gender, but also expressed, for example, by the fact that there has been no change in the uh, legislation and policy with regard to corporal punishment at home and, um, and in schools and in uh, uh, care institutions, <clears throat> which is one of the very specific recommendations that the committee made. Um, there, um, there is, uh, of course, efforts to uh, try and uh, control and, and, and change uh, the question of bullying in schools, but that is still there. <clears throat> and, and the committee, in fact, identified last year uh, what it considered to be a very dangerous cycle you know, that reinforced uh, uh, the whole, this whole sort of context of violence, corporal punishment, bullying, domestic violence, um, and all of that configurating uh, a situation that frankly does not correspond to what on the other hand Australia is, which is a, an affluent society, one of the most affluent in the world, and a multicultural society. So seen from outside, this is, this is really strange, I must tell you, uh, and it is <clears throat> so contradictory and, and so glaringly clear that I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the society as a whole and the call that it just was made by Auntie Peters for <clears throat> to get everybody on board uh, and to educate people 
and to get everybody towards improving the general conditions of all children, but especially the most vulnerable, the most uh, uh, left behind. And these, of course, among them, first and foremost, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, children. Now, having said that, um, I, let me go to the more concrete things. Uh, the committee made a number of recommendations, of course, but let me just focus on the question of, um, <clears throat> in particular, of uh, uh, the uh, care services. No? And, uh, and the fact that it would seem that while there, is, there are policies and, and uh, resources in, in, in place, there is still, um, a need to really look into how to improve the prevention of issues like, you know, taking children away from their families, uh, um, the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children in the prisons and the juvenile justice system. How do we prevent? And I think that that is probably one important message that we have to, uh, uh, you know, convey. Um, better parenting, certainly. Not, none of us is born to be a good, necessarily a good father or a good mother. We all have to learn. And we have to learn it from our own families. We have to learn it from uh, <clears throat> the society. We have to learn it in school. So better parenting is certainly one policy that would need a sharpened uh, uh, focus. Early childhood development. Um, Australia has done a lot to provide preschool to its four and five years old. But the zero to three period of life is a very important one and is one that is kind of blurred in, uh, in public policy. And it requires a much uh, more sharpened focus. And it goes hand in hand, obviously, with better parenting, with better conditions of uh, uh, living and of and decent jobs for the uh, for the parents, <clears throat> and it goes together with accessible and better quality uh, uh, services, no? health, etc. I'm, okay, I'm finishing. That's so. That's one message I would like to leave behind: prevention in all these different forms. A second one is, of course what you already have said, culturally sensitive, open, participatory systems of taking decisions at all levels, communities, local, national. And I would say very clear and transparent budget allocations. Yes, there is lots of money, but where is it going? How is it connecting the dots? Uh, these things need to be uh, uh, clarified, um, and there has to be monitoring and evaluation of these budget allocations, open, transparent, as I was saying, and, tra and participatory mm. at all levels. Let me subscribe very forcefully what I think Snake is doing wonderfully, which is launching a campaign to half the number of children out of care in five years. Let's focus on that. And let's get it. And in five years' time, in fact, in 2018, Australia has to go back to the committee. Hopefully, it will report that it has halved the children, uh, 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 the number of children out of care, and certainly has decreased the, uh, dramatically the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care and in the juvenile justice system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now hearing from the fourth panellist, Megan Mitchell, who is the National Children's Commissioner. Thanks, Kerry. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting here today. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, and pay respects to their elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge the other panel members. Uh, I'd I think it's a real honour to be here and share panel duties with them. So, um, and I look forward, very much look forward to the open discussion. Uh, I thought I'd start by telling you a bit about 
um, me and the role that I'm in, um, because that too was something that was um, that the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child had pointed to the fact that Australia did not have a National Children's Commissioner. So here I am. And, and that actually is due to the community calling for it. Um, and it does show you that you can achieve things if you um, band together and call for something. And so um, it shows the power of advocacy. And I think that's one of the reasons we're all here today. So um, my role is set out in um, the Human Rights Act. So I'm part of the Human Rights Commission. And that provides me with uh, quite a lot of opportunities to do certain things. So um, I can report to Parliament on child rights issues. I need to promote awareness and discussion of the human rights of children, and partly we're doing that here today. Um, I can undertake research and educational programs on children's rights, examine Commonwealth laws, policies and programs about children's rights, and in fact drive consistency across the nation where that's in children's um, to children's um, benefit, and so I think that's part of the conversation here today. What can we do about child protection systems in particular? And we, I'm, I'm also charged with monitoring Australia's progress in implementing various conventions, but in particular the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, yes, 2018 is the next time that we appear in front of the UN Committee, and so it would be really wonderful to be able to say um, we've achieved um, a reduction in the numbers of not only kids going into care but that we're actually returning kids from the care system because I think you're going to have to tackle both of those issues. Um, and as Children's Commissioner, um, the rights and wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are a particular priority. Um, I do have a role in advocating for all children, but the legislation does provide um, for me to focus on more vulnerable children, and I think with all the statistics that we know about, and I don't need to repeat them, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander <laughs> do... Um, uh, do much worse than their non-Indigenous peers, and we really need to do something about that. Um, I'd also add on the juvenile justice area, that's a real passion of mine, and there's a, such an overlap between the care and protection system, the juvenile justice system, um, and Aboriginal um, children are actually um, 31 times more likely to be in that system across Australia, so I think that's just a national disgrace. Um, prisons are not good places for kids. Um, that's just another institutional response um, for children. It's not a rite of passage, nor is it um, a welfare response. Um, so I'm very passionate about that aspect. Under the Convention of the Rights of the Child, there are a number of particular rights I wanted to focus on that I think are germane to this discussion. Um, some of the rights that um, are important are the right to be protected from all forms of violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment, maltreatment or exploitation, the right to life, survival and development, the right not to be separated from parents against their will unless it's in the child's best interest, and we might want to have a discussion about best interests. It's a very tricky issue. Um, the right to preserve their identity um, and family relations. And the convention also recognises that Indigenous children have special rights not to be denied um, their right to enjoy their own culture in community and with other members um, of their own group. So, and it's clear to me that for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Islander children in the care and protection systems, we've already fa failed to ensure these rights. And I think, I believe we need to operate on two core fronts. First, um, as um, Kerry and others have said, we need to redirect resources from the tertiary response end, from care systems, from removal, into early intervention, prevention, family support and community development. But second, um, we really need to reorient our care and protection systems and the laws and practices that underpin them so that they must, especially in the case of neglect, which emotional abuse and neglect is by far the largest removal reason, um, but we must um, reorient those laws and systems so that they demonstrate what they have done 
um, to address the underlying contributors to a perceived risk to a child before any removal can be considered. And I know in other parts of the world, um, some care and protection systems, neglect cannot be a basis for removal. Um, so I think it's really interesting that we should start to have a conversation because it's a very subjective concept about what it is in, through which lens and what are the supports and required to ameliorate whatever the perceived risk is to children and communities. And the other component of that, as others have said, is to genuinely and routinely involve um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and communities in the decision making, both about what is required in terms of early intervention and prevention, but also what should happen to a child who's perceived to be at risk and what's needed to keep them in family uh, and community and reduce the risk of harm to that child. Uh, I might just end there um, and I look forward to uh, talking with you. Thank you very much, Megan. Moving now to the Oxfam's Chief Executive Officer, Dr Helen Soki. Thank you for your Thanks. Thanks very much, Kerry, and thank you um, for being part of this panel. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners and to thank Auntie for the uh, welcome to country. Um, I, I want to also acknowledge the deep expertise on this panel, um, uh, and uh, I, my perspective is not um, coming from that uh, content per se, but to talk a little bit, I guess, about the experience of um, working with different communities from Oxfam's perspective and perhaps what the, um, what the reflections are in terms of where we go with this particular issue. Uh, many of you know, will know that Oxfam uh, does most, most of our program work overseas, but we have a very active um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander program which is really focusing on a strength-based approach. So, the model that we use overseas is to work with partners, to work with communities, to actively listen to what communities see as their priorities and to try to put them into effect. And I think that's what we do with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here. Um, so we work with young people in our Change Makers course. We work with um, Aboriginal women from across Australia uh, with our Straight Talk program. And next week we're gathering in Canberra with um, 60 women, I think, from across Australia, meeting with uh, female politicians and really looking and focusing on empowerment. Um, and so what does that mean for issues around child protection? What does that mean for the issues around stolen generation and the danger of that being replicated again? And from our perspective, I would make a couple of observations that I think have already been um, made here today and to reinforce those. So the underlying causes, the underlying challenges and the underlying problems in relation to child protection and Aboriginal children being taken out of care uh, are systemic and institutionalised. So that's the first point. It is about uh, poverty, it is about inequality, and it's also, most fundamentally, about disempowerment, about power being taken away from families, t powers being taken away from communities uh, to make decisions about what suits them best. Um, the, the second, uh, and I can't put it as eloquently as um, Muriel and Megan have um, when we focus on the issue of prevention, but um, I think the, the words that I would use, I guess, in response to that is that we need systemic responses as well as having an, an individual approach to different situations. And part of that systemic response, very critically, is what Auntie Lorraine has talked about, which is also changing the culture of the people who are um, given responsibility to deal with issues of children in care or in juvenile justice. And that's as much about changing their attitude or their opinion uh, as well as about improving their understanding. So that in and of itself is a big challenge. Uh, the third thing I'd want to say is that the, the, in addition to the really critical work that's done focusing on children, if we, if we look at the issue of underlying causes and um, the institutionalised uh, place of um, Aboriginal people in Australia's colonised history, um, we need the other really important activism to continue about things like legal 
constitutional recognition of Aboriginal people as the First Nations people. Um, we really need to make sure that our legal frameworks um, promote rights rather than take rights away from Aboriginal people. And part of the tapestry of what happens at the family level is the generational experience of being um, cut out of, um, the, I guess, the white Australia during colonisation and, and not having that kind of formal recognition. Um, and I also think it's important, and um, Marta made this point, that if you get some of that other stuff right, then we can actually start to talk to community about them, about mothers owning the problem as well as owning the solution, about families and local communities owning the problem as well as owning the solution. But if you take power away from people, it's very hard for them to do those two things. So we need to kind of have that systemic response. So I'd like to just make a few concluding comments and I guess to bring politics into play, if I could. So first of all, I want to say I think it's terrific that Nigel Scullion at least tried to get here and um, uh, arguably after September, Nigel Scullion is going to be a pretty important person in all of our lives and, uh, you know, I think that he has a genuine engagement with community and... Um, uh, you know, he'll be really critical. But my first thing is that I think part of what this launching of this kind of approach um, by SNAKE is to really put on the agenda that we have a compelling evidence base that says we have a major problem which requires a political solution, a legal solution and a, and a societal solution. We need that help at all, all those different levels. And the second thing I'd say with both Marta and Megan here is that we really, in addition to looking at the systems models, in addition to looking at the cultural kind of issues, we need to look at what the legal frameworks are that help us propel this issue back onto the agenda in a really fundamental way. And Megan, I don't want to make your life miserable, but maybe it is time for the Human Rights Commission to do another Stolen Generations report. Maybe it is time that we take it up to both the opposition and to government uh, before the election to say, you know, this is not just a human cost, it's not just a cost to families and individuals and communities, it's a cost to us as, as a country to, first of all, have, as Marta said, this disgraceful uh, record, but just the cost of taking kids away from families, of putting them in care, of putting them in juvenile justice. There's a business case apart from a human case, that says this is not the right thing to do. And I think this is a great opportunity to really uh, get the, the p politicians who are going into the election to stop bickering with each other, frankly, um, and start to talk about the, the horrific figures, which says there is an institutionalised and systemic problem here that we're trying to address. This is not about the fault of families. Mm. This is not about the fault of communities. It is something much bigger than the rest of us. Um, and, uh, and the third thing I would just want to reinforce is, uh, you know, one of the, the, the short time I had as Race Discrimination Commissioner and spent a bit of time in the Northern Territory and, you know, the political outcome of the Territory election, in my view, was as much about communities basically saying, well, you restructured local decision-making processes yes. and now the point of decision-making is even further away. We have to listen to communities saying they want to be involved in making decisions about themselves and we have to resource structures in those communities to help them deal with enormous complexity of problems around violence, around kids, around education, around health and all those other things. So that's we're a bit removed from the detail and I really um, honour the expertise on the panel in terms of child protection and would want to just suggest that we, we need the politics and the systemic response board into play as well. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you Hi. very much for those comments. I'd just like to hear now from our final panellist who's jumping the gun because she's so excited. No. Mr Eva Jo. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, as you know I'm Eva Jo Edwards, I guess um, I work for Connecting Home, um, a service for the stolen generation and, and I guess for me it was, and I am a survivor, I am second generation stol stolen and I guess we talk about the removal of our children and for me I guess we need to actually for our children to not be removed, I'm looking at, we need to make sure that those parents are looked at and that we are healed. You know, the healing process for us is a long time and I believe it's a lifetime. 
and you know I've I've had my own personal journey that has you know I guess taken me to hell and back and um, the survival is something that I talk about every other day because I think it's really important that you know um, that it doesn't just affect me, it affects my siblings, it affects my children, and, and no doubt it will affect my grandchildren. And, and how we stop that, you know, my belief is healing and healing for us, and I think it is time that our governments do stand up. I think it's time to revisit the 54 recommendations. Um, 26th of May this year was um, 15 years on and I think we have only implemented a few, being our link-up services, being Connecting Home, the service for stolen generations, the apology. Um, there have been healing programs, such as our Maramales with, with Annie Lorraine. And, and I guess the Healing Foundation, I think, came out of one of those recommendations. But there are many more that we have not implemented. And we, I guess for us to stop the next generation, we need to deal with the generation today. And, and I think that's really important from my own personal point of view as a stolen gen and for those that have been affected. I, um, I guess my, my job is, is about that and I guess, you know, I'm on my own campaign with, with you know, all of us as stolen generations, you know, to make sure that 2018, that was mentioned before too, we will be 20 years on since the tabling of those 54 recommendations and I, I think we've got five years to make sure that our governments do implement and, and make sure that we aren't producing um, stolen generations at such a phenomenal rate. Um, I guess it's also when our children are in care from, is that those that are caring for our children if they are not Aboriginal is that they become part of our community. I know at times we can be very um, non-accepting in bringing in non-Aboriginal people, but I think for the sake of our children that are in care outside kinship and family, we need to start embracing and we also need to start, um, you as the person caring for our children, come to our events, come to, um, you know, I think we have five or six major events for the year and, and I, I honestly believe that we can, um, as non-Aboriginal carers, be the minority for a day, you know, to encourage our children, you know, to be proud of who we are and where we have come from when we're not in an Aboriginal environment. Um, I guess, yeah, my main thing is if we need to move forward on these things and to stop our children from being removed, I, I would like to see um, us dealing with and healing with our stolen generation. We, we, we've got children that are six generations removed within our system of childcare and, and it ain't good enough. And I honestly believe that we, we can hopefully slow it down, you know. I, I, I think with the support of you out there and, and the panel here that have amazing expertise, but um, yeah, I don't think I have very much more to say on that, but thanks for listening. Yeah.